intent is a really interesting concept Mm -hmm. because in martial arts, they've been throwing that around for forever, but almost none of them really know what that actually means. Mm -hmm. You know, you do a certain technique with intent. We use it in healing. Say they have tennis elbow and I'm using an energy projection on their elbow and the intent that I set is to break up what's causing that pain, which might be stagnant chi, inflammation. I'm breaking that up, and then I'm pulling the stagnant chi out of there. It's a quantum level thing, so you you got to set the intent and then get out of the way. This episode of the Light Warrior Podcast is brought to you by Show Me Music, the very highest quality bass guitars, amps, and cabs, uh, carrying brands like Ampeg, Brigantino Audio, Blackstar, Gensler Amplification, and Dingwall, and many others. To check out all the cool stuff they carry, go to showmemusic.com, S-H-O-M-E music.com. My guest today is Brian Beller. Brian holds black belts in Taekwondo, Shadokan Karate, and he is a 7th Don Black Belt Grandmaster in Okinawan Ruku Kempo. Uh, he is also proficient in small circle jiu-jitsu, although he's never tested for a belt in that. Brian is the senior student under Michael Lomax, a Grandmaster Qigong teacher and practitioner who holds workshops, classes, retreats, uh, certification, and individual instruction in the healing, awareness, and self-awakening arts of China. Uh, the arts include stillness movement Nei Gong, uh, gift of the Tao movement Nei Gong, clinical Qigong, uh, healing with external energy, and Chinese Taoist neuroenergetic Qigong body work. Uh, for more information on this, you could go to qigongamerica.com. Q-I-G-O-N-G America dot com. I talk with Brian about his experiences in martial arts and his journey from martial arts to internal practices like Qigong and Nei Gong and energy projection and healing through these arts. So please enjoy my conversation with Brian Beller. I'm here in Terre Haute, Indiana with Brian Beller. You're kind of the guinea pig for today, Brian. Uh, Thanks for inviting me into your home. You're quite welcome. Nothing like being a guinea pig. <laughs> certainly look forward to hear, hearing what we're talking about here today and see if I can't put a little juice on the subject. So let's go. Yeah, so uh, uh, me and you met originally. I, uh, You helped me with some uh, physical issues. Um, I've had some problems with my hips, and I discovered you and uh, Michael Lomax uh uh, clinical qigong applications and uh, i've been coming out to terra hot about once a year or so for the workshops and i just happened to be out here for uh for work and i'm i was an hour away from you so we figured uh i'll come out here and uh do this in person uh, yeah and i think that's great and then what we're going to try and do is entice you to go to the the House of Chi afterwards, we're going to hit Umi, maybe have a little lunch afterwards. Oh, so. the, the sushi place? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, to twist my arm, why don't you? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm good at that, too. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a martial arts part. So, yeah, so let's be, speaking of that, let's jump into it. So you're, you've been doing martial arts for how long now? Let's see, I, I believe I started martial arts in 1976. So uh, a little over 40 years. Mm -hmm. That makes me about 45 years old. (laughs) (laughs) I'm 60. So uh, I've been doing it a little over 40 years and done several different styles. You know, we get embroiled in one style. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the styles that that I started with was uh, Taekwondo. That seems Mm -hmm. to be the, the dominant style here in the United States. And you were how old? Uh, let's see, 76. Uh, that made me 
about 19, 19. at the time. And that was your first experience with that, martial arts? That was my first experience, mm. yes. And that's, uh, you know, so you're young, you can handle a lot of pain then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wanted to be really good at it then. And we had a, uh, if you want to call him a guest instructor that came in at that time. Uh, my my uh, senior instructor would be Will Higginbotham. And uh, this guest instructor was David Gonzalez, who introduced us to Hawaiian Kempo. Mm -hmm. And he's a uh, David Gonzalez is a West Coast fighting champion. Uh, he won basically all the tournaments out then. I call it Crash Bang <laughs> Martial Arts because basically that's what it was: is Crash Bang mm -hmm. Martial Arts, and uh, and he'd won every single tournament he'd fight around here. Kind of a Small stature, he was about 150 pounds. I described his fists as sledgehammers, mm -hmm. and uh, by God, he scared most people away. And and I was one too that was rather scared of this individual. Mm -hmm. It's like, gosh, sometimes you just have to overcome your fears. And at that point, you've been you are still pretty new to it, or are you already a few uh, years I, in? I was a few years in mm -hmm. uh, when I ran into him, and I, I remember the first time i met him i'd come into the studio i think i was about a brown belt then and i'm just getting warmed up i had my gear on and i had heard this coming into the the uh, uh dojo I, i heard these horrendous screams <laughs> upstairs sound like somebody had stepped on a cougar's tail and i thought what on earth is going on upstairs and i see him in there and i got oh my gosh so i walk in get my gear on and had no sooner walked into the you know in into the dojo with my gear and uh, uh sensei higginbotham looks at me and said dave's ready for you <laughs> and i said well ready for me for what <laughs> oh, he, he wants to spar with you I said, well, how about if I don't want to spar with him? <laughs> Now, what was the relationship between Higg and Botham? Like, they were they friends? Were there, is there like a competing thing? Oh, they were friends. He had he had known uh, David Gonzalez for several years, and like was perhaps you know his only uh, students or student of uh, Dave Gonzalez around here, because Dave ran back and forth from San Francisco to Terre Haute, and he had, he had a, adopted that fighting style, that Hawaiian Kempo fighting style. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of like after the first round with him, he pretty much, I was a mop, and he <laughs> used me to mop the floor. And it took, took me several years to learn exactly what he was trying to teach. And it was one of those where I kind of drew a line in the sand behind myself, and one behind him, and he wasn't going to push me behind, behind, in that line behind me, mm -hmm. nor was I going to chase him behind that line. I drew behind him because I didn't want to make him mad. Mm -hmm. So uh, and from there I got better, and I remember that first time I actually was able to hold my own with him. He stopped, held his hand out to me, and I thought, well, this is some kind of trick. And he says, no. And he says, my man, you did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, that's great. So did you kind of make the switch from Taekwondo to Kempo? Yes, we, that... we then were really switching to a, this Hawaiian Kempo, which really was derived from Chinese Kempo. We had also switched to from Taekwondo to Shotokan, which is a Japanese style of martial art so the whole school cha yes, changed gears the, the whole school uh -huh. changed gears but you have to know where this shotokan came from mm -hmm. and we were doing that for a while i mean you get a couple years in and and i'll explain here in a little bit what these katas are these katas are these old moves they've got a sequence of moves in and sometimes i r refer to those as Um, it's almost like a gymnastics floor routine where a certain kata will have anywhere from 15 up to 70 moves, predefined moves in the kata. And many individuals are taught, well, that's the way, uh, you know, that people used to fight 100 years ago or 200 years ago, and mm -hmm. we don't use those moves any longer. 
And it was 1985 where an individual, just George Dillman, came to town. He says, I, I can show you how we'll take those moves from the kata and we can knock individuals out with them. Mm-hmm. And everybody from the school thought, well, yeah, right. That's not going to happen. How are you going to do that? So we all went to this seminar and we're waiting to see what's going to happen. And actually, I was standing right behind the first person he's going to demonstrate on. He was a rather large fellow, about six foot three, 250, 260 pounds. Mm-hmm. And the the instructor, that George Dillman, looks at me, and I thought he was looking behind me. So I looked over my shoulder, and he looks back, has this guy swing at him, and he barely slaps him on the arm, and then slaps him on a pressure point on the neck. And this guy just bounced off the floor, mm. un- totally unconscious. Wow. Scared me. And then the mm. guy, Dillman, looks back at me, and he's like, you were supposed to catch him. <laughs> Said, You're too mesmerized. <laughs> so I, I had no idea. You forgot to hold up the sign. <laughs> and so that introduced us to a whole new style, which was this Okinawan Ruku Kempo, because everything in this Okinawan style, the Kempo, all these movements are based on energy channels and the energy channel strikes. And it turns out the individual's <clears throat> that had originated the Okinawan style, they had actually spent many years traveling over to China. Mm-hmm. One individual would go over to China and spend three, four, five years in China with one of the masters in China and learn one specific kata, whether they were studying Tai Chi, Xing Yi, um, Shaolin, true Shaolin, mm-hmm. Kung Fu, and then bring that back to the island and teach a group of individuals there what those moves are and the breakdown of those moves. And the the attack points are basically based on uh, Chinese traditional med- medicine, acu- acu- acupuncture points, meridians, all of that? It's all, yeah, based on these channels. Now, these moves, as you and I had, were discussing a little bit earlier, they're all coded. It's all kind of like a um, Morse code mm-hmm. moves. You know, the, uh, any individual watching these moves might think they know what the moves are, mm-hmm. but they're all in a coded form. So if you look at them, you, you, they might, you might think they make sense, but unless you've got the teacher that actually learned the moves from the teacher that taught him the moves... And this isn't a point, uh, a matter of just the meaning is lost, like they're coded on purpose, you're saying? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. They're absolutely, they're hidden. Mm-hmm. They all have hidden meanings in the moves. And so they're hidden, I suppose, for several reasons, because one, it, they didn't just want, like, for instance, their competitor or their enemy to be able to pick up that move, mm. and or until their students could be trusted right. with those moves, because right. there's really a high moral code written into martial arts as well. I mean, it's it, it really a high moral standards in everything that we mm-hmm. do. Some call it uh, might for right, you know, that mm-hmm. we would stand up for individuals that can't stand up for themselves. Right. So there's a very high moral value, and if I can't trust an individual to do the right thing, I'm certainly not going to show him the meanings of these moves so that he can go out and maybe bully or pick on others. But there is enough in the move to prepare you for when and if you can be trusted where it'll open up to its true meaning. Yeah, and and there's with each particular move, there's kind of like a higher higher meaning to that move as we move on it's like there's meaning number one meaning number two meaning number three meaning number four depending on the amount of force i might need to use to respond in a certain situation Mm -hmm. so it might have a grappling meaning first like for instance say somebody comes up and they're being aggressive And you try to talk them out of the aggression, but they're still being aggressive, and they swing, grab, punch at you, whatever. Mm -hmm. Your first meaning of the move might be to just put them in a wrist lock, and that hurts enough that 
I'm trying to talk to them again <laughs> and tell them. Are you going to listen to me now? <laughs> you really don't want to do this. And you can inject enough pain that their receptors in their brain say, no, I don't want to do this. Yeah. Situation is resolved. Yeah, so that's a kind of like a first step meaning mm-hmm. is just a, a grappling move. And, and it sends enough pain injected into the, the body and the brain that's like, yeah, that was a bad idea. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to do that. And you might even be able to inject enough pain in there that perhaps we can give this person an attitude adjustment where maybe they don't really need to be doing the, this sort of thing to people in general. Right. <laughs> well, you no, no longer walk around thinking you're the biggest, baddest person around. Right. Well, and typically, I mean, I, I'm just guessing, but I think those types of individuals in today's world are out trying to pick on people, mm-hmm. you know, for whatever reason. There's, there's still bullies in the world that are trying to bully people. Mm-hmm. And martial artists in particular shouldn't be looking for bullies, shouldn't be looking for people to pick fights with. It's yeah. more, you know, just trying to keep the peace. And I want to read uh, off of, uh, this is uh, Sokon Matsumura. He was one of the, what we would call one of the founders of Ruku Kempo that taught many of these forms. He he was born in 1797 and died in 1889, and he was a legend for having traveled from the Ruku Islands to China. And he actually really emphasized these traits of a martial art artist, and it was prohibiting intentional violence, it rules the actions of the warrior, edifies, it promotes virtue, promotes peace among the people, it produces harmony in society, and brings about prosperity. So all really good virtues right. is what we're talking about, mm-hmm. you know, of a martial artist, not really somebody looking for trouble or looking to show people what they know. Mm. But speaking of <laughs> looking for trouble and showing people what they know, uh, so did you compete uh, when you were younger? Yes, I did. There, and. I found that actually some of those competitions were just kind of a game of tag, Mm. tag and showmanship. And Mm -hmm. so I I competed, I don't know, half a dozen times and, and, and I was a judge and I stopped competing after I was a judge because I get in the ring and I judged and I could see when these were point competitions where the first person to three points won. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last competition that I was in, I got like third place in the state. And actually, I, I the person that won, he was my mop. <laughs> <laughs> and I should have won that because I I really outpointed him. But it was the way the rules were back then. There mm-hmm. was rules against knocking people down or or if you drew blood. And all those things happened to the person I was competing against. Right. And then when it came to judging, you know, these other judges, they would just stand upright, stiff like statues. And I moved around so I could see what exactly Mm -hmm. was happening. Mm -hmm. And you had individuals that were showmen where they would they would act like they scored the point and shake their fist and yell and Mm -hmm. carry on. And there were people that were couldn't possibly see what happened Mm -hmm. that were awarding them points. Oh, wow. And I said, this is nothing but a show. <laughs> it's a game of tag and show. Yeah. Wow. And, and so I said, after after having done that a few times, I'm not playing the game anymore. Mm. And, and was this uh, Kempo or Taekwondo? This was uh, any style could mm. come in and do these. But, okay. but there's certain, like, for instance, if it was mainly a Taekwondo uh, tournament and we went to a taekwondo tournament with our hawaiian kempo style mm-hmm. of fighting they would really and if they had a lot of their judges there they really didn't want us leaving with their trophies mm-hmm. and that's where we'd get into you'd get so many points and their guys would start getting knocked down or they'd say you're hitting them too hard and they'd start taking points away so you had to, you had to, there was a fine line in between, you know, how you were scoring your points and mm-hmm. keeping your points. So it was a game. So are you, uh, are you a fan of, uh, the MMA, the UFC right now? Is that? Absolutely not. No. Uh, 
you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, it's not all about tag and points that there, there's some real combat there, but I would, I would be interesting to get your, your yeah, take on no, what's going on. No, there. I'm not a fan of MMA or UFC at all. I think it's a brutal sport. I'm surprised individuals have not gotten seriously injured. They do. And and it's going to be one of those things where it may be just a, a few years down the road where all the traumatic brain injury starts manifesting where you really see how. And that's what I think could happen is I think you'll see serious brain injuries. I've seen where individuals have picked people up, slammed the other guy's head on the mat. Yeah. And I can't believe they allow that to happen. And because originally uh, martial arts were meant as a self-defense not as one type of martial art competing against another to show who was better or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was meant for self-defense. It's not meant to prove that, you know, Kempo is superior to this or they're superior to that. That's not what it's for. And it's certainly not meant to go out and splatter somebody's brain on the mat. Mm -hmm. So, no, I'm totally against that. I mean, I, I teach people, you know, it, it, my school to really how not to fight, how to try and avoid that fight. We mm-hmm. do spar, but it's really light sparring right. and it's respectful. Everything we do is respectful. And if I ever catch somebody that's getting out of hand, we stop right then, talk about what's going on. And if they persist in trying to, to hurt, then I remove them from the school because that's my right. I kick them out. What about just as far as the techniques that you see in in MMA? Uh, you know, I, I don't really see good techniques. There are a few guys, but there was only one or two that I've seen that actually had decent technique. But the rest of them are, seem to me to be kind of brawlers and wanting to drag the guy to the ground and choke him out. Mm-hmm. Well, there's an art to that as as well, you could argue. Yeah, there's, there's an art to that, but the problem with that in real situation is if a guy's wrestling around with a guy on the ground trying to choke him out, mm-hmm. and that guy happens to have six friends, you, you can't be messing around, rolling around with a guy <laughs> on the ground trying to choke him out you would have been better one to try and resolve the situation through either a right. calm matter or if you look at the way that again the the ruku kempo works it's what we call the art of the one or two second knockout mm-hmm. and it's really um we're not hurting the person other than they're unconscious and we'll set them down on the ground and they'll remain unconscious for a couple minutes up to four hours. Wow. And I haven't broken any bones. I haven't, you know, done any real permanent damage to them. So it's it's really a, a polite way mm-hmm. of taking hold of the situation. Plus, if he's got four or five other friends there with him, I'm still able to deal with their four or five other friends and maybe talk them out of the situation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so when you're teaching though, like you're, you're saying you're kind of, you don't hurt anyone or try, try to keep it kind of civilized and pol- polite. How do, how do you know that in a real world situation that this is going to work if it does come to fisticuffs and you ha- you have to do it and, but you never get a chance to really go full clip? Oh, well, that's a good question. So so what we've done or what I've always done, we've done enough seminars, I've done enough teaching that, and I've come, if you will, I'm going to tell you my, my work has been in pharmaceuticals. So I know the double blind placebo controlled mm-hmm. study. Mm-hmm. So I never ever tell anybody what I'm going to do or when I'm going to do it mm-hmm. to make certain that it's going to work because I've seen people in other instances when the top instructor goes to grab them. They start ow and falling down right, right. and doing things. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. Is... And, and so I never, ever tell a student, I'm going to do this and that's going to be the result. Mm-hmm. Or I'm going to hit you and that's going to be the result. I'll, I'll fake doing it 15 times. Mm-hmm. So they'll never know. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's going to do this to me. I'll, I'll fake it 15 times. And then all of a sudden the real one happens. Mm-hmm. And I've got an unconscious student, but I do it very light touch mm-hmm. when I do it, and it's worked 
hundred percent of the time. And they're unconscious because you're a striking uh, a channel, an energy at channel. A certain point, you know, on the channel, there's certain. Like you're, you're not knocking them on their head. No, no, no. no. <laughs> These aren't blood knockouts. Yeah. Boxing, you get blood knockouts. Yeah. These are energetic. It's kind of like there's a a a big um, circuit breaker board on the body, mm -hmm. and if you know the circuit breakers to hit, what you get is you get an energetic unconsciousness. So. When they swing at you, push at you, punch at you, whatever, that's the setup. So mm -hmm. my first rule is don't get hit. Yeah. And I could spend 10 minutes letting the person swing at me and just, as I said before, uh, when when I did a demonstration, you turn Italian, your hands come up <laughs> and, and I'm just slapping at their arms. Well, that's the setup because mm -hmm. that puts all their, these other pressure points on notice. Mm -hmm. And then all I have to do is tap the other circuit breaker and voila, down they go. So, okay. So, uh, so what was the road from martial arts to Qigong and energy projection and energy healing? Well, that, cause in 85, then I started studying those energy channels mm -hmm. and getting in, I get interested in it cause I'd read a lot of books and I had read quite a few different books on Qigong. Somebody was always bringing stuff in on Qigong, and we were trying to do, they'd say, oh, I learned some Qigong from this person, and they'd try and do it. And I said, well, I'm not feeling anything. I just don't feel mm -hmm. this Qigong that you're doing. Yeah. You know, what am I supposed to feel? And and so I'd try it. It didn't feel anything. So I started that back in the, the mid-'80s and on. And we're doing all these energetic things in martial arts. And then somebody else would bring in some Qigong, and we're trying that. So I'm reading about it, I'm reading about it, I'm reading about it. And and then you'd get individuals that had read about how to techniques on, on doing some healing with Qigong. And I saw them do it, and we'd see it actually work. Mm -hmm. with the technique so you know you're thinking, well that was pretty cool how that worked you know this person had an ankle injury or whatever and they were using a crystal combined with a qigong technique that they might have gotten out of a book and it worked so it was fascinating me and i'm trying to figure out how it could work or where it could work and i had um we we're going to fast forward a little bit and get to it had to be I'm thinking 2001, 2002, I had some really bad plantar fasciitis in my mm -hmm. feet. Mm -hmm. And I'd gone over to Indianapolis and was getting acupuncture done on them. About all that was done was hurting my, <laughs> my feet with the needles. And <laughs> they were using acupuncture tacks. And, and I'd gotten this information from my martial arts instructor. says, go get these tacks in your feet. And it really helped my feet. It wasn't helping. You just kind of walk on them? Yeah, they, you keep the tacks in there mm. until the tacks just pop out. And, and I suppose maybe what that does and is... Just it, mask the pain with other yeah, kinds of pain? Yeah, man. <laughs> so, so I was talking to the, the uh, guy that was doing the acupuncture about my interest in Qigong. And uh, he says, uh, you know, he knew I was from Terre Haute. And he says, well, I bet you're going to go to the seminar in two weeks then, in, you know that's over there by you and i said what seminar are you talking about mm -hmm. and he went in and printed me off a flyer for michael's seminar in brazil and i said well i'm going to it now in brazil yeah it was over in brazil indiana that so it was uh -oh. just you know, yeah, about 10 miles away from me okay and so my guy that was doing the acupuncture told me about it mm. and that was the last time i had ta yeah. tax put in my feet <laughs> Uh, so what, what was your experience at uh, uh, Michael's first workshop? Well, I think by the time we got to the clinical part of it, the first time I saw a chi projection, I knew that was something I was really interested in mm -hmm. because I had been looking at it and I had somebody, I forget, I don't even know who it was that worked on my feet, but that was the first time I got actual relief. Mm-hmm on my feet because it was like I could feel it feel the sick chi going out of my feet and I mm. hopped down off the table and it's like my god they don't hurt mm. <laughs> and I don't have that sensation of those acupuncture tacks in my feet 
And was that also kind of like your first authentic experience of yeah. feeling chi? Yeah. Mm. And because and I, I remember getting uh, the chi projected at me. And I was moving and shaking about. And I'm like, you know, this is crazy because I got <laughs> great balance. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm sitting there wondering why I'm moving about and shaking about. And I said, now nah, my balance is much better than this. You know, I'm a martial artist. I can <laughs> s- s- do standing chikung, you know, the standing chikung. Mm-hmm. Why can't I stand in one place? And mm-hmm. it's, well, it's because you're getting, you're getting lit up. Wow. Very cool. Mm-hmm. And, and the plantar fasciitis, is that kind of, does it, is that history? Well, it comes it and goes. Com- it, comes it, and goes. it just depends on, you know, your yeah. activities. It's like mm-hmm. anything else. You, yeah. you spend a lot of time on your feet. I have real high arches, so if I'm doing a lot, standing on a ladder, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to have issues with it. I just had a, uh, I had some new inserts made for it, but, you know, some of the, the foot pain that I have issues come from, you know, doing martial arts for forever, banging my legs mm-hmm. up, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, crash bang martial arts, <laughs> crash bang martial arts, yeah, very cool, yeah, and that seems to be my experience with uh, uh, qigong as well. That my first workshop, well, actually, the, the first time before I came out to the workshop, you did a distance uh chi projection healing on me mm-hmm. and, and and that helped quite a bit i was uh suffering with uh, some hip issues for mm-hmm. a very long time i was on crutches most of the time couldn't walk around and uh and you did a distance uh healing i, I was kind of like at the end of my rope i was ready to like just get hip replacement surgery mm-hmm. which i was trying to avoid but i was kind of out, out of option same thing i tried acupuncture and uh, Chinese herbs, some really, really disgusting Ch- yep. Chinese yeah. herbs. The, the real deal with oh, the yeah. roaches and the scorpions and, mm-hmm. and that kind Pretty of stuff. Disgusting. Yeah, it was so gross. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so did it surprise you quite a bit? Yeah, it's, it, it, it surprised me because, you know, and, you know, chi project, projection is kind of woo-woo enough as it is when you're in the room and someone's, mm-hmm. you know, doing Jedi tricks on you. But from you were, I guess, here in Terre Haute right. and, and I was in San Diego and uh, my experience was, I, th- I think you told me you were going to do it, whatever, on a Saturday or Sunday mm-hmm. m- morning. And I didn't feel anything crazy other than, like, I just woke up at, like, 7 a.m. on a Sunday, which is mm-hmm. not something I, mm-hmm. I normally you just, like, wired for some reason, mm-hmm. c- couldn't sleep. And then noticed over the next couple of days that my my pain's gotten a lot better. I could walk around mm-hmm. uh, better, s- moving better. So I was like, huh. And uh, and I did come out to uh, one of Michael Lomix's uh, workshops. I think mm-hmm. it was here, the, yeah, the first the first one. And he did the uh, Chinese uh, what the Taoist Taoist medicine right. uh, on me, and that helped a lot. A similar experience to yours, where like right away I get off mm-hmm. the table and I could mm-hmm. a lot of the pain was gone. I kind of ditched the crutches pretty much right there and almost didn't go back on them maybe like a, for the it was a little bit of a uh took a, a couple of years to slowly uh, imp- mm-hmm. improve but there so there was an initial improvement r- right there and then I, I started doing the practice as well and that mm-hmm. little by little um so and then l- like you said there's some days where it could still bug you a little bit but overall like it tends it seems like it uh cuts off like the the downward spiral and you start mm-hmm. heading in the other direction. Mm-hmm. Probably your crutches were like a security blanket too. Not really. No. I, d- I didn't no. like them. It, it, right. in, in fact, I should have been using them when my hips first started degenerating yeah. to take the pressure off. And I didn't want to, cause mm-hmm. I was just, I d- didn't want to do it. So uh, it was just, I had to use them to the point just right. walking around without right. them was too much, too painful and also kind of risking more damage from, from, see, from the I pressure. See. But I, I don't think I really yep. treated it as a security thing. I yep. never really yeah, liked I them. Yeah. I see. So well, I was, for, for me, I have a high tolerance for pain, mm. you know, cause I just will work through it, you know, and, and I was a runner also. So mm. I would run four miles a day usually i did a lot before i like went into my other workouts but now i'm trying to do running qigong mm-hmm. and i got to get my feet to where i can mm. tolerate it for that and it's a lot easier the running qigong is on your feet and knees than regular running mm. so it, it's not nearly as hard on you as 
other running is. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of running is really not healthy, and mm. people that do traditional running always end up getting hurt sooner or later. Mm -hmm. But while we were talking about, you mentioned the distance, because I've been doing a lot of distance work mm -hmm. lately, and it, it's really interesting the feedback that I've been getting from individuals that I've been doing the distance work for, because I had an individual that got with me and their their spouse was in intensive care and so i said well, okay i'll do the work now and they described you know their heartbeat was irregular the breathing was irregular all these things their blood pressure was irregular mm -hmm. up and down and all over the place and she gave me instantaneous feedback that it, we had an instantaneous result mm -hmm. boom wow and then I had another one where I've been working on an Alzheimer's patient for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And the grandson asked me to work on grandma and his mom. Mom's very sensitive to energetics, and mom knows the instant I start working. These folks live in France, mm -hmm. and I got really good feedback from them, you know, where they say... Um, you know, Grandma's much different person ever since we started working on it. She's much easier mm -hmm. to get along with, <laughs> and and she'd had some ailments, but she had bronchitis that picked up, and I addressed that, and it cleared up the next day. Mm -hmm. Lab test came back clear. Everything came back mm -hmm. clear. But overall, she's been much easier to deal with in the nursing home, and it's just like she's been a joy to be around. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. And then the other thing that's also interesting is uh, you and a lot of other practitioners that do this, you uh, do work on animals. And yes. I really liked hearing stories about animals because with animals, it's it's not a placebo effect, most right. likely. I don't think right. a, a horse or a dog knows what you're doing. And if they see an, an improvement, that's you didn't you didn't talk them into it. Right. And that's that was one of the, the coolest ones, I think, was the, the horse that I went to work on and mm -hmm. we got a nice letter from this particular horse was owned by a veterinary doctor and I had been bugging her for at least six months to let me try that Taoist uh, mm -hmm. what we call the Taoist neuroenergetic mm -hmm. therapy on that horse and she said you know we've had an equine vet work on him we've tried acupuncture we've tried a chiropractor mm -hmm. we've tried everything and it doesn't work and the problem was the horse had been dragging its back leg for about two to three years mm. and i said well just let me try what do you got to lose and so she finally says okay come out and it was a really big horse is about what they call mm. 17 hands high so mm. that the horse's back was above my shoulder wow and I had to really stretch to do it, but mm -hmm. it was a very nice horse. And so I got got doing this treatment to this horse. And, and horses are very sensitive to this stuff generally. Very sensitive. Yeah. And, and right away as I'm working on the back end of the horse, the horse's tail starts swirling like a, a <laughs> whirly gig and is beating me to death with its, with its tail and then starts yawning you know, as I get about five six vertebrae up starts going into the big yawns big giant mm. yawns big giant yawns and and the vet's watching this and she's going oh my gosh i've never seen him do this before mm -hmm. and if he yawned once he yawned 200 times <laughs> and then he's getting real droopy real <laughs> droopy and i thought oh my gosh he's gonna lay down right here and go to sleep you're on gonna, the ground you're gonna bore him to death and what am i gonna do <laughs> And the whole time, her husband's walking back and forth and looking at me like, you snake oil selling son of a gun, mm. you know? So, it, you know, and I was about halfway up his back, and I got to walk around, go to the other side, and the horse reached back with his head and tossed me back there like, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> and, and, I, and I had to convince the horse, no, I'm just going around to the other side yeah. to do the other side. So it took me about an hour and a half to do the horse, and I got him all done, it, but Right before I got him all done, we got that stillness that comes to the room. Mm. And it was really quiet, and the, the vet noticed it, too. I said, boy, it's really still in here. And she said, yeah. And we turned and looked, and she's got like six other horses, and every mm. single horse in the barn <laughs> had its head out of its stall watching us. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it was really cool. So I got him finished, and I wanted to project chi at that leg, too. And when I went to project chi... Every single horse, as their eyes went whoop and got real big. Wow. In my opinion is they can see it. Mm -hmm. And so I got done, 
And when I got done, I says, well, I'm done. Go ahead and give it a whirl, you know, mm-hmm. take him for a trial spin here and see mm-hmm. what you got. And she started walking him, and she says, I'll be damned. And I said, what? And she said, he's not dragging that leg anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, well, I told you I thought it'd work. And so I went ahead and I gave him two more treatments just because. Mm-hmm. And when I come back for the third treatment, that horse came galloping across the, his uh, pasture to say hello to me. And we did that last treatment. And after that, she was able to ride him, and she said she hadn't ridden him for four years. Wow. So that was a heck of a, I mean, it was amazing. It amazed me. It amazed her. And it was just really an incredible, incredible treatment. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. I had a... I got to work on a horse a few months ago, uh, not as successful as as yours, and I'm not as proficient as you, but that was just... uh, my mom's friend had a Arabian Arabian horse with mm-hmm. lemonitis and he was, she's been suffering with it for a long time and he was basically ready to ha- have her put down and mm-hmm. though it was breaking his heart. Uh, and I think I kind of asked him earlier on if, if you'd like me to try and do a treatment is like, nah, not, not into that stuff. But th- this time I asked again, cause he was re- literally ready to put her down like that week. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was like, sure, give, give it a shot. And ultimately it didn't make that much of a difference, at least in the short term. She, he still ended up putting her down. But while I was treating the horse, it's l- like you said, so I was doing cheap reduction on the, on the, around the hoof area, the, mm-hmm. the joints. And, he was firstly amazed that she would let me, you know, come near her and, and get that, that, you know, close and friendly. Cause she, he said she's usually not with strangers. She's right. very skittish, especially in pain. Like she doesn't usually open up like that. And then when, uh, like you said, I, you know, I was projecting, uh, chi, then I went to try to go around to the other si- side or do something else. And she's like, no, no, no. Like she waving with her head and pointing at the hoof. Like, no, mm-hmm. give, give me yeah, some more yeah, of yeah. that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a, animals are really sensitive like that. Yeah. Uh, they, they, we had a little dog that was the same way I'd be in working on someone or working on another dog and this little beagle dachshund that we have he'd come in and he'd just go plop Mm -hmm. plop himself down saying i'm next Mm -hmm. (laughs) as i worked on him quite often and uh, he he was just really sensitive to it and he loved to have the dallas work done on him and it's like no whenever you can right back there and then he'd usually move himself around Right to where he wanted it done. Mm-hmm. So yeah, dogs and horses for sure. I think there was only one cat that I worked on, and I got up to a certain point on it, and they'll tell you. And when it's enough, they'll just turn around, and swatch you. Nah, <laughs> <laughs> typical cat. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, so you were looking for uh, for a space right now to open a studio, correct? Yeah, I believe what I'm going to do, and it's interesting how things work out, is the space that I had, I'm just going to take that back on a month-to-month rental basis because I wanted a bigger space. I've mm-hmm. had a vision of, of more people coming in and, um, you know, kind of a ground floor spot with mm-hmm. glass up front so people can see what we're doing. Uh, I'm in the process of putting up a website also. And this is uh, martial arts or Qigong or both? Qigong. And then I'll teach a few what I call semi-private lessons on martial arts because I've got a few guys that I've been teaching that have been bugging me to keep teaching them. So I'll, I've got one guy that, you know, has been trying to get his black belt and I'll take him, him to his black belt. And if he brings one or two people in with him, I'll teach them. But mm-hmm. mostly Qigong. See, I make all the guys that are doing martial arts take Qigong also. I won't teach them if they don't. Right. So they have to come to Qigong also. So the problem with the space that I've got, I can only get about six people mm-hmm. in there to do Qigong. Mm-hmm. So I was just going to offer more nights. And you have a bunch of people that are interested now that's... Yeah, I've got a handful of people that are interested. And Very it, cool. It's the, the problem with that building is that they'll only allow me to put so much on the windows to advertise it. I can't hang a, bang, uh, you know, a banner or anything out the mm. window. And so it's tough 
to advertise. So the way that I thought I'd advertise is start going around and doing demonstrations. That's how we always got people Mm -hmm. in martial arts. I could go to the local colleges, Mm -hmm. do demonstrations, Mm -hmm. because you always got one or two people that want to come when you do a demonstration. There's always a couple people that can feel it and will go, Mm. well, I like that. I could feel it. I think I'll come over and do that. Very cool. Yeah. I'm I'm kind of thinking doing a Qigong, if you do end up getting a, a spot at some point with the, you know, glass windows, uh, mm-hmm. uh, it would be probably kind of, kind of interesting people walking by and like, what are they doing in there? Mm-hmm. I could also see possibly people inside maybe being self-conscious because some of the Qigong moves are kind of weird looking. Yeah. You just kind of got to not worry about that yeah. and, and just do it. I mean, I did one out on the street. Uh, they were, we were having this downtown street festival and I went down there to do the demonstration, and there were a bunch of these, they were other martial arts students there, and you can tell some had an attitude, and, and I kind of got going back and forth with this one guy that kept trying to answer my questions for me mm-hmm. that were being asked. And so I just had to kind of shut him off. Mm-hmm. But one of his students, it was interesting, because this guy says, well, he had studied Taoism, and then I'm like, you just you know, why don't you just let me answer my own questions? Mm -hmm. And so one of his students, though, was really sensitive to the chi because what I did is I demonstrated Gift of the Tao One, and his students piped up for him. And he says, I could feel that chi coming off of him was so powerful, he moved me out into the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because this guy was trying to downplay the moves and there wasn't any chi in this student actually was the one that could feel it Mm -hmm. and i said your reward for being here and being able to feel the chi is a free dvd of gift of the Tao one Mm -hmm. very cool (laughs) so and there's really no kind of way to know what makes some people more sensitive to it than than others yeah yeah i think some you know if they're open-minded and others just have already made up their mind about things and Mm -hmm. and don't want to you know, don't want to see it, don't want to feel it, or they've already decided this Mm -hmm. is the way that I'm traveling. Because I even had that experience with my martial arts instructor where I kept asking him, let me come over and show you this, Mm -hmm. you know, and reminding him that we changed several different styles of martial arts to finally get to one that we felt was the most effective. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's hard to leave something behind. You know, you've done something for yeah. so many years, and yeah. then you go, I found something better. You know, because going back to martial arts, when I did the katas, taekwondo, I knew 25 different katas that had anywhere from 15 mm-hmm. to 40 moves in them. Mm-hmm. So you think up all those different moves. And I went to Shotokan, 25 different katas, again, anywhere from 20 up to 70 moves. Mm-hmm. Then I went to this Ruku Kempo. Well, again, 25 katas, anywhere from 15 up to 75. So you started adding mm-hmm. up all those moves, yeah. and it's like the the movements that are in, that we use, you know, in the our Gift of the Tao series, a lot of those are adaptations from Xing Yi moves. Mm-hmm. They're actually the very similar same moves that come from the katas that I use, no martial intent. Mm-hmm. It's just changing the intent. You know, it's what I call like reverse engineering. I think I said that in one of my posts somewhere. You're reverse engineering mm-hmm. those, so there's you're eliminating any martial intent, but you're using the proper right and and that, that's very commendable to be able to adapt and kind of because that's probably a big part of what kind of results in this whole you know my my kung fu is better than your kung fu and my teacher is better than your teachers you kind of put dedicated so much time and effort it's it's hard to you get rigid with it yes and that's i was trying to convince my martial arts teacher let me show you this and he just didn't want to see it and then when i finally got over there and he was going to let me show him Mm -hmm. i came in there to show him And he gave the class a break, and they were all walking away while it was my... He says, you can have five minutes, and everybody walked away. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I was the senior student, mm-hmm. so I barked out instructions. Everybody get back in mm-hmm. here now, mm-hmm. and you're all going to participate with me. Mm-hmm. And so while they were participating, because they were all doing a different style of Qigong, mm-hmm. and at this other style, this guy, every time that they would go there, would write them little certificates, mm-hmm. little meaningless certificates. Mm-hmm. And so they were glued to that style. Mm-hmm. And so they start doing what I was doing, and within 10 minutes, they're sweating, they're shaking, they're moving. Mm-hmm. And we went through Gift of the Tao one, and I'm the senior student there. And the next guy in line raises his hand and yells out loud, Will, we've been lied to. <laughs> Will's the head instructor. <laughs> we've been lied to all this time. He says, I, for the first time in years ever, I can feel the chi. Yeah. What Brian's doing is the right stuff. Mm-hmm. He's got the right stuff. And somebody else says, I agree. I agree. And they all start agreeing. He says, that's his first time ever. We can feel it. And he says, I'm following him. <laughs> I'm going to follow him. And you could just see out of the guy that had been ignoring me. Yeah. It's like steam's coming out of his ears because <laughs> he didn't want to be told he was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things. If you're, if you don't really feel it, if you're not sensitive to it, it's just kind of, you know, seems like some dumb fairy tale, yeah. some Jedi stuff. Now you uh, mentioned the word intent, and that's a very kind of deep concept. That's kind of hard to put in words. But if mm. since you have a microphone in yeah. front of you, kind of <laughs> try and put that into words. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think Michael's definition is manifestation utilizing energy and it's it, intent is a really interesting concept mm-hmm. because in martial arts they've been throwing that around for forever mm-hmm. but almost none of them really know what that actually means mm-hmm. you know you do a certain technique with intent but they don't realize what it means mm-hmm. And the concept, we use it in healing, you know, when we go into, because I'm just going to kind of expand on it when we're using it for healing. A person's got pain in their elbow, and I'm going to try and explain it in that way. Say they have tennis elbow, and I'm using an energy projection on their elbow. And the intent that I set is to break up what's causing that pain, which might be stagnant chi, inflammation. I'm breaking that up, and then I'm pulling the stagnant chi out of there. Mm -hmm. But first, I've got to loosen that up, and then I've got to also eliminate the inflammation in there that's causing the pain. And pain itself is kind of a strange thing. I mean, mm-hmm. what's causing the pain? you, mm-hmm. you got to really work on that that's causing the pain. And so the, my intent's got to be to take away the pain also. So I'm mm-hmm. using a multi-layered intent. And is that sort of like a maintained focus that you're doing throughout the... No. Or, I, or it's just like an inst- like kind of like an impulse like the intent for me to move my fingers i don't think about it just do it and it's kind of so what what we're doing in in stillness movement lineage it's a quantum level thing so you you got to set the intent and then get out of the way yeah yeah so you go boom you set the intent do the projection get out of the way because i don't sit there the whole time and go intent intent intent, because then i'm getting in the way of it i just set Mm -hmm. the intent do the projection and get out of the way because it'll happen. It probably happened right when I set the intent. Right. And I'm just following through with the the projection. It's a quantum level event. It just it's unlimited when I do it that way. And I had a great example. Actually, I'm going to jump back over just a second to mm-hmm. martial arts because I had a really great jujitsu teacher who was Professor Wally J. That was Bruce Lee's jiu-jitsu teacher mm-hmm. and he always used me as his dummy when he came to Terre Haute <laughs> he called me judo man which I didn't know judo it just so <laughs> happened he he showed us all 10 techniques he was going to show us that day and he wanted somebody that knew judo 
and the guy that volunteered didn't like the pain that he got after he demonstrated on him. He went and hid. And, and I looked sufficiently like judo man, so he used me the rest of the day, and he used me every time after that. Mm-hmm. And he showed me exactly how to do all these techniques by the pain. So I'm doing this technique to this guy at another seminar, and I had grabbed and just done that finger lock that we did at the mm-hmm. seminar, and the guy, I barely touched him. Mm-hmm. Just barely touched him. And the guy yells, oh, went on the ground. This guy was like, I don't know, fourth degree black belt, whatever. Mm-hmm. Barely touched him, and he went on the ground, and he's yelling and carrying on, you're being rough. Mm-hmm. And so he says, I can be rough back. And he grabbed my finger, and he bent it all the way back to, like, my wrist, but it never hurt. Hmm. And I'm like, huh, wonder why that didn't work. And I sat there and thought about it for a minute, and I thought, because I had the right intent. Mm-hmm. I put intent, I put energy and the technique, energy and intent into the technique. And he was just doing a purely physical thing. He was doing purely physical, I'll be rough and bend your finger back. But mm. he missed the whole boat. Mm. He didn't use intent. So mm-hmm. when we go and then back over to healing and Qigong, it's very important to use the intent, use the right intent for each situation that we're working on, whatever it is that we're working on, if we're doing distance, I have somebody describe that situation to me. Mm -hmm. But then I'm open to once I get in there and start doing the work, to throw out all the garbage that they just said, you know, Mm because it might be you just overloaded me with a bunch of junk. Yeah, yeah. And be open to listening Mm -hmm. to what I actually need to do. And that seems like that's almost the central point to the whole practice is to kind of just forge your ability to to create intent right yeah Yeah, i call that our wild card Mm. intent is our wild card Mm -hmm. compared to i don't know what other systems are doing because i've been doing work for for other people that are doing other systems that have these other masters they work for but they come to me to do their healing work and Mm -hmm. i'm not i don't ever give them a hard time back but i find that interesting that they have me do that and i had one of them ask me a question recently well when you're doing this how is it that you're doing this why are you so effective is it because you're having you know the the deceased masters of the lineage doing the healing for you (laughs) <laughs> no, <laughs> not. not that I know of. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, that, because they figured there's got to be something going on that why is it that it's working so well for you? Mm-hmm. And they don't understand that. And I try to explain it the best I can because they it's like the, the guy that, you know, his grandma had bronchitis and he just couldn't believe. Boom, it's gone. Mm-hmm. It just worked really well. But it's intent, listening you know, listening to exactly what I needed to do and doing it. Right. And then it's, it's very hard to nail down what exactly it is. Cause it's, it, you don't really want it to be like a mental thing. Like right. you're not thinking, No, but, but, but it's kind of hard to avoid doing some sort of a visualization or at least a nonverbal thing. The, the thing that I think helps me is I try to move, out of my head and kind of like do it from from my dantian almost like that's where my brain is right absolutely i i, I take my brain totally out of it mm-hmm. or my mind totally out of it and i just get into doing it and i'm it's like i'm waiting for instructions to come through mm-hmm. as i'm working as i do a distance one i can see the energy body and see disturbances in the energy body mm-hmm. And listen, because I I remember one in particular where I was working. This wasn't a distance. This was in per, in person, and I was working on this individual. And, and I might have done the higher level method with her, but she was a uh, uh, ALS or a Lou Gehrig's patient. Mm-hmm. And at that time, boy, it's like I was really I'd start working on people and really blast <laughs> blast them with mm-hmm. G. And I started doing that, and the, the, as I'm listening, says, uh-uh, you need to reel in that and go much softer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I did, right the second I did, the patient goes, oh, 
mm-hmm. and re- really relaxed. And, mm-hmm. and was, then I got C. I told you. <laughs> You know, you just can't blast everybody with G. Some people you can blast and yeah. blast the stuff out, but you got to learn when to blast and when to be soft, mm-hmm. when to go easy. Mm-hmm. And I've taken that lesson because I had to do that several times. You get fragile people. You yeah. Can't, you can't blast them. Yeah, yeah. That's a good good point to learn for, for me as well. I kind of sometimes tend to... Uh, try and come come at it guns blazing but mm-hmm. maybe maybe mm-hmm. not always the right the right mm-hmm. way to do it yeah yeah some people just can't handle that or the situation doesn't call for that mm-hmm. so it's very cool that this system is available in the states and it, you know it's very weird for me to come out to the midwest to learn you know ancient chinese taoist energy projection mm-hmm. uh but it's kind of weird how it just kind of works out that way where it's found its way out here right yeah i mean the individuals still think you have to go to china to get things mm-hmm. and and i think the current state of affairs in china you i don't know that you find anybody over there that has authentic um qigong uh, the way yeah. the way things are there they've got their thumb on stuff yeah and uh, i don't really think you'll find any authentic individuals over there i think those individuals will be in hiding yeah yeah if i'm sure they, they're out there but that you probably can't really advertise that st- stuff too much unless you want to go the way of the falun gong thing mm-hmm. yeah they'll be in hiding so you know i i saw it was really interesting there was a group from china came over and they did a program here at our rose holman institute of technology it was a group from china and they were obviously doing iron shirt qigong mm-hmm. and showed several things that they could do. And it was impressive watching them, you know, but they were, uh, it was more physical right? what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And, and they had a little bit of internal ability, but, uh, you know, it, it was more probably like what you, a demonstration you might see over at the Shaolin Temple. Mm-hmm. So I, and I don't know that there's any you know what exactly goes on at Shaolin I know people that travel over there to see it and if you were to make a prediction where do you see this art form going do you think it's going to still be kind of uh just going down a lineage kind of with a small group of people that get it uh, you think it might grow and explode you think it might get bastardized kind of the way a lot of stuff tends to get west you know when it gets popular uh, referring to the stillness movement lineage? well maybe maybe qigong qigong as a whole let's say well uh, you know that's the thing it's not all systems are created equal right so you have individuals that'll pop up and say i can do this and i can do that mm-hmm. and i'm whatever that's the one of the problems with yeah and that's detrimental to all stuff like this because there's a lot of yeah. wackadoos out there yeah so i mean that that's uh does become an issue so i mean we can just only do the best we can do mm-hmm. to put it out you know i'm putting together a website to try and put a website up and be mm-hmm. more modern because I've always kind of flown under the radar myself. Mm-hmm. And I've decided, well, now's the time I need to be a little bit more active. So I, I got a site domain that I claimed as my own. You want to uh, blast it out? Yeah, 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 I've called it spiritslightchikung.com. Spirit slight? Spirits light. Oh, spirits light. Chikung. Chikung. Dot com. Very cool. But it's not quite active yet. It's not active. I just okay. grabbed the name Very while cool. I could still get the name. So I've got the name and I just have to build the website. Mm-hmm. And that's the name of your uh, your school as yeah. well? Yeah, that'll be the name of it. And I've kind of separated that from the martial arts mm-hmm. and part of it. So Does the martial arts have uh, have a name? I'll or? probably just call that Terre Haute Ruku Kempo or and change mm-hmm. that name if I decide to go somewhere else. But I figured the spirit's light and just travel with me wherever I go. Very cool. So if anyone listening is in uh, somewhere close to Indianapolis, uh, Terre Haute, uh, spirit's light, is, you're not going to find 
<laughs> you, you won't find anything till I build the site. Well, I was going to say you won't find any, any uh, anything quite like it, but yes, yeah, you won't yeah, find it until yeah, until it's right. done. So that's right. Well, then, then I'm on the National Qigong Association mm-hmm. site. Also, they they advertise for us, and so there's a blurb on the NQA mm-hmm. site. And you're on Facebook too, if people want to find you and yep. get in touch with you. Yep. Very cool. So for teaching or for any kind of uh, health issues, uh, distance healing, you, right. you do so you don't necessarily need to be here to get the benefits of it. Right, right. I do a lot of distance work right now. People can find me on Facebook. Uh, they can get a hold of me by my email. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give that. It's up to you, sure, yeah, if yeah, you want to get. Sure, my email is birddog. Mm-hmm. So it's B R D D O G eight two two at AOL dot com. I'm one of those old fashioned <laughs> AOL dot com. Yeah. Is that that's still? I know. I've got a Google account. Are you, I've been, you sure that you sure that email still works? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've got a Google account. I've been moving over to the Google account, but I've got so many people that still get a hold of me at AOL. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, In fact, me too. I've got to. I got to shut down that AOL one and, and before they shut you down. I don't, well, I, I think they're still got serious along. concerns about AOL. I think they're. I think they just got bought out by. I don't know. Maybe yeah, that was yeah. a while ago. Actually, I think they put stuff on there to screw up your account themselves and then try and sell you spyware and, yeah. and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. actually, you don't need to deal with that anymore. Mm-hmm. And then you could also find you could forward mail from that account to like if you set up a gmail account you could still have your mail forwarded to that uh, yeah. but anyway. well that's i need to just go straight to my gmail instead of yeah um well i guess i know you need to get out of here pretty soon so we could wrap this up any final final thoughts final words no i just uh you know i would encourage anybody that's thought about this uh you know to look into coming to a seminar i put a lot of healing stories on the dow bums Mm -hmm. so and the dow bums have a new site they now spell it d-a-o bums so it used to be with a t yeah it used to be with a t so now it's with a d now it's authentic now it's correct (laughs) but they have yeah they have an area called healing circle Uh in there and so i've created a spot there healing stories of the stillness movement lineage Mm -hmm. and so uh, or if we got any of our members you know from the stillness movement group that want to publish a healing story in there because i've been in there putting stories on there you know of people that i've worked on or i'm Mm -hmm. answering questions for people about like the Taoist neuroenergetic or projections Mm -hmm. or whatever so there's kind of an area in there that people might find interesting so yeah but i encourage people to you know if they're interested or thinking about it you know they're they bought a dvd and say i'm not sure whether i can feel it well you know a dvd can take you so far yeah yeah uh, you got to come to a seminar it's like yeah i bought a dvd on something in martial arts well did you really expect to learn (laughs) the martial art from from a dvd you know you can learn the the moves but if you want to learn it you got to go to the person that that put out that dvd yeah yeah absolutely well, all right. Thank you for talking to me. Yeah, well, thanks for coming over today. I, I really enjoy it. So I did too. I like talking about it. I like doing it. So, hey, thanks. All right. Thank you. When the sun rises from the east, we should Sunset